Okay. Hello. Welcome to Facsimile. I'm Ryan Brown, author of Dear Coffee Buyer and your host. I'm joined by Tony Kinesny. Hello, Tony. Howdy. We're excited to cup some coffee with you. We've ground each of the four samples in bowls in front of us here, and I'm heating water now. Subscribers, I hope your samples are ready. You'll want, a, you, you'll want to use a ratio of one gram of coffee to 17 grams of water. My cups have 11 grams of ground coffee and I'll pour 187 grams of water into each of them. Feel free to pause and catch up. If you're not a subscriber, Facsimile helps you become a better coffee taster. Each month we send you four carefully selected skillfully roasted samples to cup along with experts. You can subscribe in the link below. And speaking of experts, our guest cupper today is Tony Kinesny, better known as Tonks, that's T-O-N-X. Tony stumbled into coffee two decades ago as a barista and roaster at Seattle's Victrola. In 2006, he reimagined the cafe experience with the arrival of Intelligentsia into Los Angeles. Frustrated with roasting companies ignoring home coffee drinkers, he founded Tonks Coffee in 2011, an exclusively direct-to-consumer subscription business at a time where that was not really a thing, later selling it to Blue Bottle. Um, I happened to be around at that time, too. <laughs> uh, teaming up with Sumi Ali, Tony designed the $1 coffee project for local and founded Yes Please, where they roast a fresh, unique, uncompromising weekly blend for the home coffee lover. You can follow Tony on Twitter at Tonks. Again, that's T-O-N-X. If you have an appetite for occasional coffee hot takes and retweets about the climate catastrophe. Tony, <laughs> It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. I can't wait to cut these samples with you. It's, it's great to be here. It's, it's weird to be on the inside of this instead of uh, just an observer. Another note is that as per usual, Scott Rayo, our very own Scott Rayo is in the YouTube chat fielding any questions that come up. In the last session, I encourage you to email us questions and we got a bunch of those. So, uh, and, and I'm really looking forward to them. So, uh, Tony will be able to help us and, and hopefully Scott can jump on too. There's definitely some that I think all of uh, our guests will be able to help with. And then I'm also, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. This is new. I can't promise you, I will not be extremely distracted by what's going on. I can't promise you any amount of responsiveness but I am going to try to keep an eye on the chat. So if anything comes up and it makes sense for Tony and I to, to pause and make sure that we explain or describe or elaborate on something, we'll do that. Sound good to you, Tony? Sounds good. Perfect. One other thing that we're doing differently, so many people were sending me their cupping notes that I decided to create a little cupping results survey. It was included in the email that I sent yesterday. It was also included in the calendar invite for this. You can find the link there. Um, please go, if you've already cupped, please go and input your notes, your scores, your notes, uh, and your guesses about uh, origin region for these samples. If you haven't, um, at the end of this cupping, there will be a little, a little bit of time for you to get them in before uh, Tony and I kind of take a look at th those aggregated scores. So that's something that I'm at least looking forward to today. Uh, all right, so before we get started, I want to make sure that I have all my equipment because otherwise I will definitely forget something. I've got each of the four samples, one, two, three, and four from my left to my right. Uh, I've got a spittoon, I've got a scale because I'm gonna weigh my water. I've got a score sheet. I'm using the Cup of Excellence cupping form from the very first Brazil COE of 2002. Uh, and I also have uh, my two rinse bowls Tony, do you have all your stuff? I have all my stuff. Okay, perfect. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but it's, you know. Yeah, we'll, I used we'll to need it. We'll find that when we find it. I used to have a bucket, but strangely, this room used to be someone's in-home salon. So I have a sink over there now, which is wonderful. 
Um, and then finally, Tony, is your water heating? It is heating. I'm going to throw it back on the boil. My, okay, my water is boiling. So I'm actually, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to stop it so that we can smell these and just talk about what we smell in each of these. Cool. All right. Number one. Do you kind of want to pause through each one and talk it through or just kind Let's of do that? Yeah. Run what do you okay. smell in one? Well, I mean, I, I'm, I know you've talked about this before. I'm not kind of a big believer in fragrance. I sort of usually on the fragrance round of a table, I'll do a very quick pass of all the coffees and I'm just kind of looking for anomalies or anything that stands out. Um, I mean, to me, one is is pleasant. Um, there's maybe like a little spice edge to it that's pretty soft. Um, it tastes has that sort of fresh, open taste. Like yeah, I anticipate it being a, a pleasant coffee from that. Like no red flags. Yeah, sure. A lot of times I'll go back to number one too. I I'm smelling something in the sweet nut or praline or toffee category. What about two? Uh, by contrast with one, I feel like it's it's got it's got more sort of aromatic depth. There, mm -hmm. There's more going on in the middle of it. Um, you know, again, it might make me anticipate something, but I, I I don't read a lot into fragrance as a okay as an indicator. Getting some vanilla and chocolate. I agree that these are all, that those two at least, and also the third, which is very milk chocolate to me, are in a similar span. <laughs> Anything standing out to you about three before we get to four, which I know will stand out. <laughs> right, there's a lot to say about four. Um, no, I mean, I, I feel like three has for me like, maybe a slightly like earthy, almost like concrete mineral edge to it um, that, the, that the first two don't, um, a, a flatter, but, but again, nothing that I would see as like a, oh, okay, I, I better watch for this one or I'm anticipating something special from it. All right, Tony, talk to me about four because I know you have something to say about this one. Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> from from just you know the first squeeze of the bag when when the package arrived, I assumed that this was uh, a natural dry process, anaerobic, something um, unusual, um, which I could be wrong, but um, but that's um, you know it's that weird sort of um, pleasantly <laughs> overripe fruit. Um, floral edge. Um, I smell yeah. dried stone fruit. Also maybe something in the caramelized, in, the, in, a, uh, in a caramelization category. Right now in the fragrance alone, uh, caramelized onion. There's something I'm getting in that category. Are you ready to pour some water? I am ready to pour water. Okay, perfect. Ready? Okay, Start your engines. Oh, I should I should probably put this on the scale, like I always do. Okay, pouring 187 grams into 11 grams of coffee. I've got to say, uh, you know, cupping in the lab with a dedicated pouring kettle that. Um, pours big and fast is uh, a lot better for this than using a pour over gooseneck kettle. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you on that. I, I think I want more different kettles for different jobs than is reasonable or realistic for a, um, a you know, for a home. Uh, I don't, this, this is the facsimile lab and, um, the spoiler is that it's also my home. 
you're using that kettle on a um, uh, induction? I am. Yeah, it's it's an old one. In fact, Tony, it was <laughs> the it was part of my Tonks cup, my Tonks home cupping lab. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, uh, it's very noisy, but it works. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into the aromas of these before we break them in a few minutes. So one is definitely that strong toffee and some hints at something closer to a little bit of fruit that I wasn't really getting much of when we first, when we were smelling the fragrance. How about you? Um, it definitely, there's, there's a lot more going on than, than what I was getting in the fragrance. Two is to me smelling more strongly of brown sugar now than the vanilla and chocolate I was getting in the fragrance. Yeah, kind of, um, candy bar, like, like butter finger. Mm, um, yeah. Uh, that sort of, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't describe like a too much nuttiness to it, but it's kind of in that, in that candy You know, bar. we're approaching that one time a year where I eat about uh, 50 pounds of candy in a two week period of time. I mean, it's, it's, it's upon us. Like I should start preparing. Yeah. That. Well, pal palate training is very important. So. Uh, how about three? Um, three feels to me like, uh, um, I would say like hollow connotes something bad, but, the, but there's like a, there's, there's, it's, it's like, it feels like there, there's a lot of nice kind of florally things going on in the periphery, but the center is kind of, it's open. It's like. I got some floral notes from it when I was smelling it. Something in the in the citrus zest and floral area. How about four? Um, surprisingly, four to me feels like very one dimensional. Um, huh. compared to kind of, it, it was all fireworks in the dry and now it's, it's, it, it just feels like it, it's not super compelling. It's, it's got an intensity, but, um, I'm going to break these cause we're just a little bit, just a little bit late here. Yep. 15 seconds. It's going to destroy everything. <laughs> everything. Screw, <laughs> we've screwed it all up over. now, Ryan. <laughs> Salted caramel in one for me. Mm -hmm. Two is something in like a plummy area. Yeah, definitely like a something in the dried fruit, raisiny, figgy, like um, that. That is intriguing to me. Yeah. <sighs> I really like three. I, I don't think about like balance um, when I'm thinking about aroma, but um, but it just feels like there, there's a nice range of, of flavors hitting. Like that's that's a really um, pleasant spectrum of aromas there. And that's in number three, right? Three, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a question if number four looks a lot lighter than the others. I'm not noticing that personally. I, I noticed that when I was grinding. Um, it, you know, I, again, I don't want to read too much into it because I've tried to be a little bit blind going into this. Um, mm -hmm. and intentionally didn't do a lot of examination, but it, it did seem like four was um, lighter and the, the, the weight texture of the beans was, was different. Yeah. So. 
I took, you know, uh, I guess there's, it's interesting that question because there's two elements of what light means in roasting. There's the literal, you know, the actual color as, as would be measured by, you know, by our eyes or by a fancy uh, $20,000 machine. Um, and it, it is actually lighter in that sense, but it, I, I, you know, I know the, the degree of control that goes into the roasting to make sure that we have a straightforward assessment is, um, I would like to, I would like to make the case that it's unparalleled. Uh, and that sense, I certainly feel like from the fragrance and aroma, I'm not getting any notes of underdevelopment and we'll, we'll see, but, um, pretty confident that I didn't mention my, my aroma notes on four on the, before mm -hmm. we broke, I was smelling dried apricot and a little bit of conquered grape in the break. It turned into more of a, an interesting wood. I, I, I described it as eucalyptus. That's the shorthand I would use for that when it's, it's not a woody in an aged way. It's woody in a, in a resiny sort of, ways. yes, resiny. That's, I like that. Feeling that. Thank you. Uh, great. So we will, we'll return to start cupping these probably in about 10 minutes, uh, because I have a very sensitive uh, mouth. Um, <laughs> as we do something that I think that I would, would be remiss if we didn't discuss Tony is that yes, please, as we mentioned before, has a, a weekly blend that changes and you note the coffees in it and you discuss them individually, but Specialty coffee is kind of all about the single origins. Did you not get the memo? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've, you know, I, I could give you a 30 minute manifesto on, on kind of how I feel about blends. But I think, you know, one of the things that's um, unique about what we're doing is that uh, we only really have one type of customer, which is people that are making coffee at home. Uh, we're not supplying cafes. We don't have our own coffee shops. We don't have a wholesale program. We're not selling to grocery hotels, yada, yada. We don't have a tech department sales team, you know? Um, so we're really only serving one master categorically. And then, um, because of that, we're also only doing one single product. So we don't have a product line. There's no offering list. Every week we put out one thing. Um, and we want that thing to be the best thing that we can possibly make it. And it was sort of a, you know, when we were doing the, the infamous <laughs> $1 coffee blend for local, you know, we were buying pretty extraordinary coffees um, and, uh, and blending them, which seemed to some people kind of sacrilegious to take, you know, 89, 90 point coffee, blend it, sell it for a dollar. Um, <laughs> but I, I think like what, what we sort of felt like our, our, you know, line in the sand on that was that um, there is no single origin coffee, no matter how beautiful or complex that black box on, on, on a mug or cupping table, not knowing the story behind it, not, not sort of knowing, mm -hmm. you know, the, the categorical intrinsic details of it, that you couldn't make taste better if you fucked with it with one or more additional coffees. So, it, 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 and, and I think that that's from a, from a purely like culinary perspective is it's, it's, it sounds like heresy, but it, it seems to me pretty hard to argue with that, that you couldn't improve upon the, the finished product of any coffee by opening up the door to, to blending. And so it's always upset me when I go into shops that have big offering lists or multi-roaster cafes and the barista is like, yeah, I don't really like the espresso today. or I don't really like what's on drip. It's like, well, you, you're someone who tastes coffee for a living. You love coffee. This is your passion. This is everything. Like you have a pantry full of opportunities here to like fix what you think is wrong. You know, do you have the, the, the power, the ambition, the, the authority to, to do that? Because like, I see there's a, it's a Guatemala over there that you could blend in with that espresso right now and fix that thing that you find is, is unpleasant about it. So I think, yeah. you know, I've, I've always made a concrete. I, I think I'd love to hear. So um, first off, I'm sure no one will disagree with this. Uh, <laughs> I kid, of course, I'm, I'm sure there will be plenty of people 
there, there's so many things that you just said that, you know, are worth picking apart. The one that, that I noted early was, do you believe that storytelling is meant to distract from incomplete coffees, incomplete single origin coffees? Um, I, I think it certainly can be. I think, um, yeah, I mean, that's a can of worms, right? Like, I, I do think that there's a degree to which a lot of what we talk about with coffee or say about coffee, um, using our customers as, as an audience <laughs> um, or a mirror to, to our sort of um, professional ambitions or kind of need for, for validation um, is problematic. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, I mean, there's a degree to which like we're all in the business of selling coffee. You know, we have complicated offering lists at most roasters um, and, you know, every coffee has a home and there's kind of an attitude that, you know, you kind of, you, you have to sort of appeal to as many people as possible. And so I think that means that, you know, sometimes you've got an 83 coffee on your offering list that, you know, you want to attach a story to or, you know, make people feel something about its character, its origin. And, and I think, you know, it's also why I have a, a problem with, with how much of, um, you know, the sort of flavor wheel language of cupping has, has become like the primary way that we talk about coffee. And as, as a roaster and as someone who blends coffee, like I, I find that that strict flavor wheel language, like it's, it's great if you need to fill cells on an Excel spreadsheet, but it's not necessarily a useful way to like, um, reinforce your own discernment about what you like, what's good. You, you can throw a lot of beautiful sounding flavor descriptors at an 82 or 83 point coffee, and they won't necessarily be lies, but they, they won't necessarily reflect the fact that this coffee is So what's, is what's not better then? Uh, a strictly SEA approved flavor wheel happy descriptor or an insanely personal descriptor that nobody else could possibly understand, but you, um, and you know, the well, truth. I'm, I mean, I, I think, I think, you know, if, if I'm talking to, to people in the context of like, as individual cuppers who want to improve their skill or, or have some sort of career trajectory in coffee, like, I mean, I would err on the side of, you know, be your own guru, trust your own instincts, like the, the, the primacy, you know, to, to, paraphrase Terrence McKenna of the, you know, the felt presence of immediate experience, how, how you receive that coffee is the most important thing when you step up to a table. Um, if, if you make that secondary to any other consideration that, you know, you're, you're just kind of being a machine. And, um, but I think for, you know, for customer presentation, I think it's really like, you know, are you in a position inside of your role in the industry to be, you know, completely honest and frank about those coffees with, with the person that you're presenting them to, or is there a need for you to sort of be seen as a professional and, and talk, you know, sort of 50 categorical ways about what this, what this is and why it's special to someone who's going to taste it and be like, all right, it's an 83 point coffee. And I like, I guess I don't like coffee as much as you. I clearly am not as enthusiastic about this as you are, which I think is something that the coffee industry has done a lot of. And it's, it's set us back um, right. of having this sort of um, internal expert ontology that doesn't really have uh, a, a, an approach and on board for, for the consumers and enthusiasts and um, you know, would be connoisseurs that are out there who love what we're doing, but, but can't necessarily interact with it the way that we do. Um, Someone has said bravo tonks regarding flavor wheel ain't useful. <laughs> I <laughs> mean, as a roaster, it's not super useful. I, I do think it, I do think it gets in the way, but it's, it's nice so to have pretty. a shared vernacular. It's very pretty. Everyone should have one up on their wall. <laughs> Your cupping lab is not complete without it. I, there, there's, there's a hole in the wall right there right now. That's, that's going to have a, a totally useless flavor wheel. In all seriousness, if I, if, I, if I make sure that I understand you, what you're saying is it kind of depends on what the goal is and who you are communicating with. Right. So, so I think that, you know, 
obviously like coming into this and you and I've had discussions, I've been thinking about cupping and this sort of 40,000 foot level coming into this. Um, and I, I'll try not to digress, but the, you know, it, it really is about the context that you're doing it in. And I think that there's a certain mentality that's very like procedural machine like that says like, look, if you, you know, you're a novice, you're the Padawan, if you want to become a cupping Jedi, here's the way you always have to do it. It always has to be blind. It always has to follow this procedure. You know, it's important to learn the scoring form and all of its intricacies. And like, I mean, maybe if, you know, Q grader is your goal or, you know, or you have a certain mentality about what it takes in a sort of meritocratic illusion of what this industry is, um, then, you know, go for it. Or maybe your mind works that way that you just have, you know, that sort of organization. But I, I think that a lot of that sidesteps that like anyone can step up to this process for the first time, e even as a novice and discern preferences. And, you know, it's, it's so I, I, I encourage people when they're note taking to just, you know, if you encounter a coffee and you, you, the words escape you, there's not a descriptor, but you have an experience of it. If it makes you feel like, oh, you know, then put a frowny face on your cupping form because when you come back around the table, you're going to be like, oh yeah, that's the one that made me like, Ugh. or that's the one that I put a question mark on because there's something in there that I just couldn't pin down or understand. I think it's yeah. like, you know, teacher on the first day of school, like you don't know the names of all the students, but you're like, okay, that's the one with funny hair. You know, that's the kid that's wearing a winter jacket and, you know, September, like what's going on. And you, you, you need to just like pin all of your impressions on something that you can say about that coffee on the table, even if it's not something that fits in a SCA approved cupping form. Do we taste these? Is that good? Did I kill some time? We're <laughs> yeah, you, th thank you for cool filling enough. that time with some uh, stimulating content. Great. Let's get caffeinated. Let's, uh, let's start with one. Temperature is perfect for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, if this were if this were a real cupping, which this is not, this is a fake cupping. If this were a real cupping, <laughs> then we would not discuss openly what we were tasting because it is facsimile. Uh, please openly respond. You can do frowny face if you prefer, or you can uh, use strictly SCA approved language, whatever you like. <laughs> Well, I think like if I were scoring the acidity on this, I would give it a 6.75, uh, no. Um, I think, uh, is that slurping terrible with these AirPods on? I have no idea. Nope, um, you're good. Cool. Hey, if, if someone's watching this and they didn't want to hear the sound of slurping, it's you've come to the wrong place. That's true. I, I want to hear you do an old school Ryan Brown slurp. I know you've changed your ways, but. But it's, that was it's special. None of it's I don't even know what the, the microphone would do with that. All right. So are we going through the whole? Yeah, let's uh, do it. Let's talk about, okay. let's talk about one. I went okay. to two just so I could better taste one. Yeah. Contrast is super helpful. Mm-hmm. What do you taste um, in that? Uh, first of all, I like it. It's mm. immediately a coffee that I'm uh, that that I want to warm up to. Um, I feel like uh, the body is a little light. Um, the finish is kind of halting, and some of that again is like, you know, I do cup at home a lot, but you know, in the lab, things are slightly different. And until I hit these other cups, like I don't feel like I'll have a good benchmark of like, oh, okay, they're all tasting a little light. They're, they're all kind of finishing this way with this water and this context. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with all those caveats, um, yeah, it has like a, a like praline, like little kiss of caramel, just like a, a smooth, sweet. Um, there's... There's a bit of a, of a like zesty citrus acidity on there that's um, pleasant to me. Mm -hmm. 
it's it has a bit more fruit in the in the cup than it did in the fragrance or aroma it's still the, the fruit quality is not so distinct that i think like citrus is a good note because there's something about it that reminds me of almost the type of citrus notes that you get from a dark chocolate mm -hmm. it's not quite it's not like oh it's definitely lime or lemon or something like that it's kind right. of in that category vaguely in the constellation of citrus yeah yeah the citrus constellation that chunk of the sky astral <laughs> it's in, it's in the sign of citrus what about two Oh, two is interesting. <laughs> Write down interesting on your cup and cup. Yep, got it. Um, interesting. It's, uh, it feels like a little, little zigzaggy to me. Like there's something going on in the front, something going on in the back, and something totally different going on in the middle that doesn't tie them together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know what you mean. It's, a, it's it's certainly a more it's a coffee that develops over you know ten seconds, ten fifteen seconds on your palate. the The lingering aftertaste on it is nice. There's something um, that feels like kind of um, woody or like like a a dark sugar mm. uh, character to it. Um, that's not unpleasant, um, but, but it's usually not something that I would seek out. Um, I feel like as soon as I start thinking about what I would score this, it's gonna focus my like attitude about it. But right now it's sort of, I, I, I'm, I'm really on the fence of what to think about it. Yeah, it's, so it's, un, it's unusual to me, um, but, but, but very pleasant. Yeah, yeah. I tend to refrain also from scoring on the first pass, even, you know, when I'm by myself. What I'm noticing is it, it has the brown sugar that I was getting in the aroma. Mm -hmm. There's something, um, so like that, that's very strong for me. It, it also has a little bit of that coffee that we also tasted in one. It's a different type. It's, it seems more caramely and less like nutty in its toffee quality. And, and then in the finish, I'm describing it as lavender right now. I'm not sure that I'm right about that, but that's what I taste right now in that mm -hmm. finish. What about three? I feel like I'm getting a, a an upfront acidity that has like a little like passion fruity tropical kind of uh, zing to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you identify? I, I'm struggling to identify what those flavors are. Yeah, um, it's kind of like I I, I feel like I I don't know my apples very well but like when you get an apple that has that sort of like floral aromatic to it mm. when you bite into it it's got that sort of quality to it so not a pine apple no not, oh, okay. not for okay. me no like a hold like hold a on, fancy just... seasonal farmer's market oh, apple hold on let me just erase this okay <laughs> yeah, certainly a more lively fruited. Um, it's it is a complex acidity that is also has nice structure to it. It's like I I am confident. We'll see. I'm confident that that acidity will hold up until it's cooler. Mm -hmm. How's about four? Mm -hmm. 
different specimen. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the blender in me wants to like, <laughs> knock that down. Um, into into being a background singer, but um you have extra bowls over there? I do. I think so let's not do it yet. <laughs> because people will never forgive me. Um but <laughs> but but after we score them, I'm gonna I'm gonna you're gonna tell me what to blend and we're gonna taste that. Because I mean cool, like we, right. we have we have yes please here. Why would we not see what happens when we blend some Great. all for it. Okay. Um, yeah, what are, you, what are you tasting for? How would you parse that? So dried berry, probably blueberry. Yeah, it tastes like those freeze-dried blueberries that you get at Trader Joe's. Like you pop hmm. up in a bag of that. And You and my mom. Kind of thing you would put on your cereal. Trader Joe's references. Um, yeah. Uh, something that reminds me of hops or kind of that resiny wood that we were getting in the aroma. Um, certainly the, the mouthfeel isn't um, it, it's, not, it's a nice mouth feel it's full, mm -hmm. but it's, it's doing a good job of supporting the, those flavors in that cup. Yeah. It finishes really kind of creamy and, um, mm. again, I feel like it's not a style of coffee that I'm usually drawn to, but, um, yeah, but I, I'd go out on a date with it. I would do, I do a first date. You know, okay. we might not have a lot in common. We might not, you know, be meant for each other, but you know, we, we could have fun for dinner or movie or something. Okay, let's score these. Mm, someone said durian on number four. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest, never had a durian. Same. I've been around <laughs> durian. Um, I've had more conversations about that fruit than any other fruit. But on on no, cupping tables. Tip for coffee. I don't, uh, I don't think I've ever heard no. of in a tasting before, but. Our mutual friend, Drew Catlin, certainly would sometimes throw out durian just because he had spent a lot of time out in those islands. Yeah. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's score these, starting with okay. one. How do you feel about that? What would you score that? Um, I feel like as it cools, it's kind of, it, it's getting a little thinned out, less dimensional. Um, I feel like first impression, I was um, more excited about it, um, but but not like, I don't feel like anything new has developed as it's cooled. Um, but first guess, first pass, I probably feel like that's in the, high 86 almost 87 like it's just it's it's an unusually pretty coffee um again as a, as a blender i feel like this isn't something that as a cupper it's a coffee that i'm gonna keep getting drawn back to on the table but I, as a coffee drinker i i feel like it's it's lacking something that makes it like like it, it feels a little a little thin to me but um I'll tell you what I, I like. So I, 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 I could easily revise up to, to 87 or slightly higher. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm around 86 to 86.5. Okay. I like, so this coffee hits the things I'm usually primarily focused on. It has, it's sweet. Mm -hmm. I would score up on sweet. I like the acidity. It's not a super complex acidity. It's not a super complex coffee. The flavor verges a little towards a 
nutty toffee more than like, like that caramelized toffee. Mm -hmm. So I like it. It's clean, but it's not for me. It, it doesn't, um, it doesn't quite transcend itself. So probably I would score up on sweetness, clean cup. And I'd be kind of like average ish on, uh, which to me means kind of like aiming closer to 80, uh, 84 on the overall on like mouthfeel flavor aftertaste. Uh, so for me, it's an 86. Yeah, I, I actually, the aftertaste on it for me is, is super pleasant. Um, hmm. Okay, nice. There, there's, there's, there's some nice, uh, you know, again, I, I want to say like praline or some, some sort yeah. of like little, like soft candy resonance that that carries through that I I, I think from a blending perspective is something that you, you'd still taste even if this was a small part of the final blend. So let's talk about. I would two. buy that coffee. Okay, here we go. The complexity here is is really compelling. Um, I want to keep tasting it. I want to keep drinking it. Um, I, I I'm I'm at a loss for how to sort of describe that that middle of it. That it's like vaguely tobacco. Mm. Um, uh, I'm trying to save some for our cup and for our blending here in a second, but yeah. Well, I'll tell you how I score it, if that's okay. If I go first, yep. I'm I'm gonna score this an 87. Okay. I to me that brown sugar is persistent mm -hmm. from fragrance through this cooler cup. The acid is a little bit weaker, but it's, it's staying there. That, that's, that's what hurts it from being, you know, a next level coffee. A little bit of plum, a little bit of those florals in the finish to me. I really like those coffees that have that dark sugar quality, that brown sugar, or you called it dark mm -hmm. sugar or darker sugar earlier. Yeah. Almost getting towards molasses. Like I, if, if you can make coffee taste like molasses to me, I would drink it all day long. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, kind of, kind of like a, a, stewed pears or something to me like that interesting um yeah like a caramel or like a yeah cooked pear yeah huh. mm -hmm. nice. yeah it has like a would go well with some sort of a cobbler or something mm. what doesn't all right what about three three oh you didn't make me score um oh yeah two. what would you score too um, I think my, my instinct was to probably treat it as an 86, but, um, I'm going to say 86. Okay. But I, I, you, I leave it, you, I leave it open to revise it. I, it's. This is good. We disagree on one and two because we, you yeah, prefer think, one to two. Yep. Uh, let's talk about three. Um, structurally, I really like it as it, as it cools, like it feels like it gels together. It's, it's nice. Um, the aftertaste is there's, there's something exotic and, and, um, fruity berry like there. Mm -hmm. Um, like almost kind of a tangerine-y, um, like a, like artificial, like, like tang or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Definitely something in the orangey citrus arena. I, I do. I do feel like it, it doesn't have the sweetness of two 
um, and maybe less so than, than one. Um, the, the mouthfeel that the finish to me is a little drier. Um, so it's a, it's a know. cuppers coffee. It's really interesting acidity and flavor enough sweetness that it's, I mean, it's, I think it's holding its own. Yeah. Uh, I scored this in 88.5. I, I really like it, but I agree that it doesn't quite have the sweetness on the same. Um, uh, it's not quite balancing the acidity with its sweetness. Right. Yep. But, but I, hard, hard to find fault with it. Um, I, I, I'm curious to know. I'm curious to know what it is. Uh, some um, interesting punch curious, notes, oh, floral, bergamot. Um, yeah, I'm getting vanilla in the finish. And and I just I think that acidity. It's it's that's just a really nice acidity. Very mm -hmm. complex. All right, four. I'm gonna say 87. On Perfect. Three. You know, four as it gets cooler for me has kind of a like corn, Fritos corn chip, oily kind of something that I don't like um, mm -hmm. that feels more present now. And that there's a like, I mean, there's still that, that, you know, rotting strawberry, like, ugh all over like that never goes away um this you know one of the few things that's like keeps from fragrance when you grind the coffee or fragrance when, when you open the bag to like the the last sip of any cup you brew of it like it's just this persistent organoleptically aggressive uh chemical flavoring that uh it just destroys any other thing that you want to say about these kind of coffees and why I don't buy them or drink them. Yeah, they let's teach their own. They certainly, it's certainly hard for that coffee to perform well on a cupping table because there is that wood, woody quality to it, which I think is becoming more pronounced as it cools. Mm. There is still interesting fruit a, a mixture of almost fermented and dried fruit flavors happening in it. And I don't mean rotten fruit necessarily. There's some fun notes in the ch chat, uh, everything from incense cider to tropical fruit, roasted banana, which is something I can profess to never having had, uh, strawberry and blueberry. Really? You never, you never thrown a banana yogurt. in a campfire and with some chocolate and I haven't. wrap it in aluminum foil? I don't. What's the point of this? I don't prefer bananas. Yeah, I mean, I I could I could see that that it, it had like ripe cooked banana has that like aromatic like yeah that yeah um yeah I mean actually like thinking about like banana bread or or any of that it's uh I, I, that's a good <laughs> you you could uh, uh walnuts included. Sure. Uh, I agree. What would you score? So, on? personally, if this were on a table and it was just us, I'd, I'd, I'd probably like trash talk it and give it a an 85, 85 and a half and pretend I was being generous. I think if I were in a context where this score mattered to the producer and I was trying to be a little more open-minded and objective about it and take my own preferences out of it that for what it is um it's a pretty decent example and and, and it would probably get like an, an 86 but but really i ha i have a ceiling where coffees like this are not gonna get very good scores from me but but for You're our not purposes going to buy for, it so there's no reason 
to give it for you in most situations, there's no reason for you to, to expend the effort to give it a proper score. Exactly. I'm not going to, I'm not going to have an internal philosophical debate about what this is objectively. We're not buying it. (laughs) Right. I, I think, you know, I'm, and this is me being, you know, an old curmudgeon, but to me, these coffees are for novice roasters, novice drinkers, novice coffee buyers. They, they stand out on the cupping table. People have a lot to say about them. They're easy to assign descriptors to. Um, but I don't think, I, I think the, the number of people that enjoy drinking them is, is marginal. Um, mm-hmm. And you, you just as soon like put a bunch of like 83 point Sumatras on the table as far as I'm concerned. Oh. It's not, not my, not my stees. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I don't dislike it that much, as much as you do. I think it's sweet. I think it has interesting flavors. I think the wood, the woodsy qualities to it are interesting in themselves. And let's be honest, like we're talking about something that we'll, we'll learn more about it. Like we're talking about something that has probably different, a different type of process. Yep. Uh, I would score this. I will score this. And... Let me just taste it one more time. When it was hot, if you if you demanded a score from me after the first pass, I think I would have given a much higher score because for for the things I dislike about it, it I felt like it was it was very sweet and interesting, and the the forward acidity had some dimensionality to it. It finished really smooth and creamy. As it's cooling, I feel like like that floor has dropped out of it, and yeah, I'm I'm only tasting the negative. And it may be because I've just spent more time on these other coffees going into it now where it's diminished by comparison, but I'm giving it I won't disrespect you for giving it a, a nice score. I'm giving it an 86. Okay. <laughs> well, that's all right. <laughs> is, uh, is that, did, I, did I neg it for you too much or what would, would you, would you have felt differently on your first pass versus as it cooled? Do you, do you feel the same sort of, and, and I uh, guess see, as, I, as a more medical, I question, think it's holding up. Worry about I think it's holding up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And truthfully, most of my final score reflects my final pass. Yeah. Most of the time. Okay. Do you ever feel like you get a score in your head and then like your final score is several points different than that? Or, or do you really just <sighs> rarely? Like, I mean, because I feel like I'll, I'll, I'll usually like first spoonful sometimes like the only thing I'll have to say about a coffee is like, fuck, 88 points. Like, like, I, I just I know that that's like, stop the count. <laughs> there's a bullseye there that has a score on it. And this just like, hit it for me. It's like exemplifies that number in my head or something. Um, and, and it doesn't shift for me. But other times I'll, again, I'll hit a coffee and I'll think, okay, this is this is going to win me over and it's going to intrigue me. And I get all the way back around the table and it's whatever I was, whatever tickled me the first time is gone. And I'm. So when I'm cupping, I, the first pass is just for notes. The second pass is notes, but also I'll give it a preliminary score. Second Mm -hmm. pass uh, or third pass is um, my final score. Sometimes there will even be four passes. So I actually have three scores. Uh, but my final score is my final score. I don't like average the scores over the passes or anything like that, but there, there would be some information from pass to pass. Uh, and I could do that shows, you know, trends or, or range. I just, it's not something I've ever prioritized. Yeah. And the other thing important to me is that I will not look before I taste and score. I won't look at what the, what the score was on the previous pass. And this is typically on larger tables with more samples that where I can't possibly remember like, oh, I gave this one an 86.5 last time or anything like that. Right, right. Yeah. Um, Do you, how, to what degree do you, um, how often do you change your score in sort of post, post table discussion with, with other cuppers? Do you, do you compare notes? Do you revise? Like, I feel like I, I you might I would only on ever cupping. change my score based on what I taste. Now, if someone tells me I taste X, 
usually bad thing in that coffee and I go back and I taste it. Right, like a de- I, an obvious defect that you missed or- That I somehow missed. I'll, I'll tell you yeah. something though, Tony. That only ever happened to me when I would set up several bowls of samples together. I don't cup like that anymore. I scatter my bowls, so I don't know. So after I, after I grind, I take colored stickers and put them underneath the several mm-hmm. bowls. And then I scatter them. Sometimes I'll even ask for assistance from my daughter, Millie. She'll like help me move them so I don't <laughs> know what's where. And then I'll essentially reassign them A through you know G or whatever, or A through Z. And, and then I'll just cup each individual bowl. And the reason I do that is I'm far less, I think you get complacent when you're cupping two, three, four bowls of the same coffee in a row and you miss things. Yeah, I, I can understand that. So, so in the context that most of my cupping has been in, which is, you know, post roast evaluation of roast profiles. And this was, you know, it's true. Yes, please. It was true for Tonks. It was true, you know, back in the Seattle days when I was roasting mostly for espresso that, you know, you might have, you know, anywhere from three to 30 batches that you're tasting of the same coffee with only small variations in roast degree. And so actually having that, like, you know, going in completely blind or scrambled, like it might be good for you as like kind of a, you know, building muscle as a cupper, but as, you know, for the mission of what's happening on that table, like it's, it's, I, I think like, Blindness is great if you're training for the Cuppers Olympics, but it's not necessarily right for every context. And I think as a roaster, it's very helpful to like know on the table, like, okay, these are all the batches of this Peru and this one stands out as being different or this one tickled me in some different way and look, you know, looking at your roasting sheet or, you know, whatever people who rely entirely on crops or do and figure out, you know, what, what did I do differently? That's um, yeah. that changed that coffee. Okay. Time-wise I'm, I know that I know for sure that we have more things to do than we'll have time to, to do them. <laughs> so before, before people start bowing out, um, I bring think in Scott? What would, what's that? You're going to bring in Scott? Uh, Scott? <laughs> no, not yet. Sorry, Scott, not yet. I think what would be great, what, first off, again, we, so we're, we're done evaluating if, if you're out there and you've cupped and scored these and taken notes along with us. I'm, I'm seeing some creative notes in the chat. So I, I know that that's happening. I know you're doing it. Go and put your scores and your, there's a few questions and some guesses around the regions that these are from, which I think will be fun. Uh, cool. Totally optional and just for fun. Uh, this is not a guessing game. Uh, it's about, it's about scoring, but Go put your scores in that. It's it's in the email I sent last week. It's in or it's in the event that I sent last week. It's in the email I sent yesterday. So please input your scores in that so that we can discuss them in a moment. Tony, what would you blend from these? What sh- what should we do? Uh, yeah, that's that's grab an extra idea. bowl. Um, yep. So got my very special uncle mug. Um, and so cup blending, which I think everybody should do at every opportunity that they have, um, is basically saying like, okay, two parts, this one part, this just spoon it in and see, yeah. see what, see what dynamics, even if it's not something like, okay, I think that this would be an interesting blend. It's more like the question of like, oh, this thing that I like in number one, um, let me just see if I can come up with a premise here. <laughs> And this, this is how you work out if two or more samples will play nice together in a blend. Yeah. So, so typically like in the weekly cuppings that we do for Yes Please, we'll put every production roast from the last production on the table um, and samples of anything that we're considering bringing in, stuff that's on the water in the warehouse that we've already committed to and just kind of like get the whole pantry of options there and then you know, once everything is kind of at this stage and we've, you know, cupped and evaluated and questioned anything that doesn't seem like uh, it's behaving the way we expected and made our buying decisions or whatever, then um, we'll work out what the next week or maybe the next two weeks of blends are going to be by just all of us going around the table and cup blending and tasting, proposing something. And um, I love it. 
being so what, very what, caffeinated and excited. What's your blend? Um, well, okay. So to me, um, I really like coffee. Number one is the star of the table for me. I feel like I want it to have something more going on in the middle. Um, but I, I like, I like the way it is up front. I like the way it resonates. So I, I want to do like, see what happens if we take one part of that to like, um, half part of number two. Um, oh, that's way too, con- I'm just going to do two parts of number one then. I can't <laughs> do that. I can't yeah, do half sure. a spoon. Wait, so, so two parts, two parts, one, and then one part two. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think there's a, you know, um, getting like the brown, I'm getting some brown sugar, some orange. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, they, they, they play nice together. Um, I don't think it draws out anything new, but, uh, nutty. I'm just going to spill coffee on my floor. It's fine. I'm going to try one part three, one part Mm -hmm. two. I think I may have lost you, Tony. So I think I lost Tony. Oh, sad sound. There we go. I can't hear you. Can't hear you. Unmute. Yes. Fantastic. There you go. It took me a surprising long, surprisingly long time to figure out that you were not there. Okay. So let's, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that, what did you end up, did you mix two and three? I, I did. I liked it. I thought that okay. was nice. Um, it got kind of limey with those two mixed together. You know, in a, in like a limey, like in a pleasant way, not in a. Not a yeah. straight line. So, I, I mean, I, th- I think, like, if I were trying to come up with some blend on this table, like, I, again, like, one is my favorite coffee, and I would just kind of play around with, like, what proportions of other coffees might fill out some of that middle that I think is, is missing. Enhance. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Would you like to know what these are? I would love to, if everybody's ready for that. I think what would be fun, first of all, is to tell you how people scored them and what they people thought they were. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we have a lot of results. This is great. All right. Awesome. So the the average score for number one is an 86.33. Three three. Repeating, of course. Okay. Um notes from uh Chocolate, dark chocolate, raspberry, citrus, clean, some nutties in there, lots of caramels, Mm -hmm. um, lots of caramels in there. Uh, So yeah, and why do I not see? Yeah, I feel like if I could EQ this coffee, I just wanna like take everything that's in there and just bump it up a little bit like like it's a nice coffee it's just just it just wants to have the volume turned up 
So, <clears throat> Tony, where where do you think this coffee is from? <clears throat> it doesn't. It, you don't need to specify a country. You can. Yeah, you can um, speak with. I mean, I, I would presume it's a Latin America. Um, I might situated as a Peru, um, but only because we have a lot of Perus right now and there's so much variety. It's like kind of easy to pin something in Peru because I'm tasting so many different things from there right now. <laughs> it's like the safe guess is like, yeah, this could be one of those. So this is number one is Finca La Esmeralda, not that one. <laughs> Uh, it's Castillo and <laughs> Colombia varieties produced 1,600 meters above sea level and processed by Jean Urquina on his farm in Acevedo, Huila, Colombia. This coffee was imported for us by Collaborative Coffee Source. Ooh. Let's talk about number two. Number two had us an average score of 86.14. So... The audience agrees with you that in, in aggregate, that one is a better coffee than two. I'm seeing notes from lemon, chocolate, spice, floral, uh, Cheerios, tart hmm. peach, uh, lots of stone fruits. Um, yeah, lots of stone. I'm seeing lots of stone fruits across the board and brown sugar, which admittedly I mean, if you wanted to write, if you wanted to design a coffee that I would love, it's stone fruit and brown sugar. Also a dessert. That also would work for a dessert for me. <laughs> uh, number two. Do you want to guess? Um, I, don't, I don't have a strong guess. Um, Think uh, I'd place it oh, in Central America. Okay, perfect. Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> no, go for it. Go for it. There's, there are no I've fincas. No There's no fincas in uh, <laughs> East Africa. Okay. Finca Tuya, which is a mix of varieties, Pache Verde, Catura, Criollo, Bourbon, produced 1550 to 1920 meters above sea level under the management of father and son duo. Armando and Mauricio Gomez. The coffee is washed near Todos Santos in Huehuetenango, Guatemala. Imported by our very own Regalia Coffee Roasters. Okay, let's talk about number three. Number three has an average score of 87.5. Ooh. Yeah, and, it, and, and it's also like harder to categorize the flavor notes because they're, they're like much more spectrumed. Uh, floral, orange, plum, lots of florals, lemon, tea, watermelon, berries, a grass in there. <laughs> Someone also said something I can't place, which I appreciate. Uh, apricot, um, mango. Yeah, lots of things in there. Tony, yeah. where, where might this coffee be from? Uh, I'm going to take a wild guess and say Burundi. No. La Esperanza. <laughs> it's a Bourbon <laughs> variety produced 1550 to 1920 meters above sea level, washed with the oversight of farm manager Aurelio Villatoro near Boya Blanca in Huehuetenango, Guatemala. Also imported. Oh, sorry. This coffee was imported by Panorama. Yeah, that's a that's another another guate number. Is that four. coffee available green right now? Asking. You know, for I truthfully I don't know, but you should. Everyone in, out there should reach out to Panorama and, and tell them you kept it on facsimile and that you loved it. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, I love coffees from Weiwei, and that's that's a, a unusual. Um, I like it. Yeah. Number four. Average score is 86.7. Um, 
but it's worth pointing out that I can, I can also tell you that there's a pretty big, well, the, the range is from 80 to 91. It's one of those coffees. Strawberry, yeah. jammy, blueberry, lots of strawberry, cherry, chocolate, blueberries, funky, durian, tropical fruits, papaya, licorice, cloying, fizzy candy, uh, fermenting <clears throat> red fruits, <Warheads>. grape, <laughs> roasted banana. <laughs> <laughs> fizzy candy right like candy. candy earl gray tea um put that on your halloween list yeah tony where where might this be from um i don't know who's who's screwing around with with uh weird processes kind of everybody now um could be from anywhere uh but I, I'm gonna say that it's a it's a Latin American coffee. Like I don't think that this is a Ethiopia natural. Um, also, like if I were gonna like use the beans as clues, mm, actually, you know, I thought it was like a bigger bean when I was grinding it, but now I'm like less sure. Okay, I have no idea. <clears throat> It's worth pointing yeah. out too. So we, you know, we're also <laughs> asking people to guess where they where they think it might be from. Uh -huh. A lot of these are East Africa, and um, a couple uh, Oceania, Southeast Asia. Um, there Any are some Yemen guesses in there. You know, I didn't have that as an option. Uh, okay. I should include. I, I mean, I can include in the future, I, and I'm not always sure that we'll necessarily do the same thing. Like I can tell I mean, you that we'll do it differently next time. But I would say like a decade ago or, or longer before you know kind of everybody and their brothers started doing naturals that this would be on a cupping table like very close to some of the better yemeni, yemeni coffees yeah or, yes, like, let me talk a little too refined to be like a grade four ethiopia but but now naturals are everywhere and it's sort of who, who even knows this is Azote Java Natural. So it's a Java variety grown 1,150 to 1,300 meters above sea level, naturally processed on raised beds for nearly five weeks by Stuardo Coto and family in San Marcos, Guatemala. Imported by our very own Regalia Coffee Roasters. So Tony, I, I kind of deliberately did this to you. Uh, Tony and I, the last trip that Tonks ever took was, or that we all took together was to Guatemala. Um, we had a fun time. And I thought it'd be fun to give you a table that's mostly Guatemalan coffees. There is that, that Huila, the first coffee. Yeah, um, I, I mean, that's, that's cool. Those are, those are three Guats that feel uh, like special and distinct. Um, I mean, I, I would say like the, the, the two Weiwei's in there, I would not like, I feel like Weiwei coffee is, that's that's my like glazed donut, you know, center of the bullseye for me. And uh, and I like, that's a surprise on both of those. I, I would not have pegged that. Lots of guesses for East Africa from number three. Yeah. Um, for the most part, people were kind of on target with two being a Central America, one is kind of split between Central South and East Africa uh, in terms of the guesses there. Um, so that's fine. Did anybody I, guess Guatemala on four? Well, you know, I just did it regionally for this first one because I okay. wanted to throw people off on the fact that there were going to be three Guats. I wanted, <laughs> I wanted them to think there was such a... I, I, look, I'm definitely trying to trick people. I, I'll just be open with that, okay? So um, I, I, I find it fun. Not, not, not to make you feel dumb or anything. I just... I, I, I would enjoy that. So that's what I'm right. You could do a whole one of these of just like standard cupping table pranks or something. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's definitely. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring Scott in. We also have a bunch of questions. We have some great questions. And we'll try to handle, we'll try to do as many as we can. Um, so Scott will not know that he's coming on. Table pranks or something. 
Uh, I mean, that's definitely okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna bring Scott in. We also have a bunch of questions. We have some sorry, Scott. And we'll try to handle. We'll try to do it. time travel. Yeah, that latency. <laughs> Hi, Scott. Hey, 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 Tony. Hi, Ryan. How are you? <laughs> hey, good. We're day. doing well. Um, thanks for being there. Yeah. It, so for... we were able I to pay attention. The test. No, no, not at all. I, I failed a hundred percent. So don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> That's impossible because I know you know what they were for. <laughs> yeah, but I, I also. Um, because I know I mix them up when I cup them. And of uh, course I knew, I knew what the natural was, of course. And I, I, I knew the Esperanza because I tasted it a few times, but I wasn't really, you know, it's, it's also, I've been um, traveling and, and working with some of the worst uh, brewing water of my life for the past month. And um, it's been, I've, I've learned a lot about how much the water is affecting the coffee and uh, it's horrifying actually. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Uh, uh, Tony. Tony, this was wonderful. You, you, it was amazing having you. Um, people responded really well to a bunch of the things that you said, especially about the blending. Um, I think I think people, I call it the spoon method. I think a lot of people had never heard of it before. So they're pretty excited to try it because it's, it's so effective. Yeah, it, it shocks me how little people do it. That I mean, when, when a lot of roasters who actually have a lot of blends on their offering lists, like will go through the trouble of like weighing and proportioning the coffee, like, like doing all this extra work to like present their options when, you know, in five minutes on a cupping table, they could iterate through like 20 different possibilities. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't know how you feel about this, but I'm, I'm always a little scared to blend without the spoon method just because, you know, different roast batches of the same coffee can, can affect the blend, you know, if the roast batches aren't yep. always, you know? Yep. And I think that's part of like what with us, because we are iterating on this every week, you, you start to like intuit what the delta is between what you're getting on the cupping table when you're cup blending and what like, okay, like we assumed, you know, this was going to work this way. And then, you know, the gestalt of like the finished blend is like, okay, that surprised us. That's something totally different. And, you know, and then you do the same thing of like reconstructing it from components of cup blending and seeing if like proportion changes affected or. Yeah. 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 I will say from experience that I, I don't find it very effective for espresso as far as like the spoon method like mm. predicting how a blend would be as espresso mm -hmm. because the grind and espresso can be so touchy when it comes to adding different coffees you, know? you yeah. know the two of you have written well scott a book tony articles that are essentially say everything like everything i'm about to say applies except for espresso uh that was the <laughs> that was the subtitle of your book right scott well everything but espresso yeah, yeah. everything but espresso and <clears throat> Tony, that's definitely an article or two that you've, or, you know, a post or two that you've written in the past. Yeah, I think there's still one buried in the back of the Blue Bottle blog or something. <laughs> but I, I did a revised version of it that's up on Best Police. The Frequency. Yeah. Tony, you said something that I, I had a rare reaction to, um, and it was great. Um, you said that the, there's no single origin. You couldn't make taste better if you blend it with other coffees. And the reflex in me was like, that can't be true. And then I thought about right. it for about 10 seconds and I'm like, okay, that's true. So it's that, hard I, to formulate I, a counter argument to it, right? It's like, yeah, I mean, I mean, the counter argument is that like dreamy 95, right? That I'd be scared, I'd be scared to blend it. But at the same time, you're, you're probably right that any, anything could be improved. You know, it has to be true for one very simple reason, which is that, and, and just to be clear, it doesn't mean if we have four samples here, you can definitely make three better with one, two, or four. What it means is right. theoretically we can improve it. And of course it's true because unless you scored it a 100 points, <laughs> then you're then you're openly admitting there's something that could drive this coffee higher. So yeah. now there it might be that it's only theoretically improvable and not practically improvable, but I would right. certainly, I would at least agree unless you're scoring at a 100, which of course we should point out does not happen. Uh, Frequently. Except on coffee review, it happens a lot. <laughs> right, review. not going to touch that. Um, yep. I, my, we have some... my attitude is like, you can go as high as a ninety-two, and yeah. like I won't give you a side eye. Like, like I'm, I, I'll pause, but yeah. anything above a ninety-two, 
you need to defend it like a doctoral thesis. Like yeah. I want to see essays. I want to see supporting materials. Like, like you need to give a Ted talk. Like I'm just <laughs> 93, 94, like, like we're going to have words 95 and above. And I, I just like, I, it's going to be really hard for me to ever take each series ever again. Yeah. It's also, I mean, Ryan has talked about this in previous cuppings, but it's it's really hard to score coffee that high because what context do we have? What what do we have to compare it to? Like nothing. Oh yeah, this um this is a ninety five because it's just like that other ninety five I had. Like it doesn't doesn't happen that way, you know. No. Yeah. No. Um, uh, I have a bunch of emailed questions that we can oh, start wonderful. with. But what did you? Yeah, what did you get from the chat of notes, Scott? Um. The chat really consisted of um, actually this this chat was very lively it was it was wonderful um, cool. people were pretty stoked about the blending people were um, having an interesting time talking about the natural and I think some of the some of the the cuppers weren't necessarily sure at first it was a natural so to them it was uh, an interesting contrast to the other coffees um, and everyone seemed to have like a nice, I get the, I get the vibe that there was a nice balance for people of quality and contrast in the coffees. Cool. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I of course really delighted in having three guates on the table that I knew would taste very different that each that, you know, kind of one of them kind of tastes very central to me. One of them tastes much more like an East African. And then one, one was a wild card that could be a natural from almost anywhere. Yes. Yeah. I, I want to, I, not to divert from the many probably interesting questions we're sitting on, but like, you know, you guys have been in this a long time. I've been in this a long time. I feel like as things have progressed in terms of how, you know, farmers process coffee and what's happening at origin, even sort of taking aside all the naturals and anaerobic and all these, you know, fads that are infecting uh, coffee right now that, that like <laughs> it, it used to be, you know, 15, 20 years ago, fairly easy to like taste coffees on a table and be like, all right, that's a, you know, Guatemala SHB, like the, the, the uniformity around origin characteristics of most of what you would encounter in samples and cupping was such that like, you know, regional characteristics were strong and clear signals. And now it's, you know, with so much more micro lot separation and sort of varietal considerations that, that there's, you can't make blanket statements about sort of regional terroir flavors as easily as you might've been able to 10 or 15 years ago. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I imagine that what we used to think of as terroir or regional flavors 20 years ago had a lot to do with people from a given region would probably all process coffee in, in whatever the classic way is in that, in that area. And now that everything is, is cross pollinating across the world, you know, Ryan, Ryan's had Peru's that tasted like Ethiopians and Kenya's on the table here and things like that. And it's like, I, I, I it's, it's exciting and it's interesting, but I also worry a little bit that we, we might be, it was kind of reassuring a long time ago that like a Guatemalan tasted like a Guatemala. Right. But but that as micro milling has progressed, that that farmers are getting more ambitious, or yes. um, and and green coffee buyers are maybe asking for more differentiation and yeah, I see it a little differently. I so I think that is an aspect. I think the other aspect is, and it was kind of encoded in your question, Tony. If you're tasting a Guatemala SHB, you are necessarily tasting a blend of lots of different coffees meant to capture the essence of an area. So if you, you know, if, if everyone in, in Guatemala is meant to have an orange crayon, but a few of the producers <laughs> have, have a purple or a green or a blue crayon, but then once you, you know, if you melt them all together into one massive right. crayon, and draw something, it's going to be orange again, right? Like the, the purples, right. all that stuff will disappear. But and, when and you there start are to people pick in the out chain the who are going to select out uh, those those oddballs too to yes. like preserve the the premise yeah. of what they're blending for. But even if they're blended in there, we, you'll just you'll never notice it. You'll it, it will the the qualities that support the status quo will will be adequate, and the other parts will be lost in it in that blend. Yeah. 
I mean, it's, it's interesting to think about it in terms of like, uh, you know, developing as a cupper in this era versus like probably when we started cupping that like the, the, the guessing game is so much harder now yes. than it would have been um, then. And like, I feel like the guessing game was, was pretty central to yeah. how I thought about tables and um I mean, I'm thinking that is you know, why good, I good do food it. awards where we had, you know, tables with coffees from everywhere in the world, completely blind, um, all in that high scoring uh, region. It was, yeah. It's actually, it's comforting to hear you say this because I have felt more and more insecure over time about being able to guess where a coffee comes from and i just i just felt same with me why can't i do it and then you're actually making me feel much better about it so <laughs> I'm, I'm rationalizing my uh, <laughs> my lack my lack of skill you know you'll get jeff watts or somebody on these and <laughs> he'll, he'll guess everything you throw on the table <laughs> it's good to realize that you it's good to realize it on at least a weekly basis to be surprised by something that you learned or, or in, in the case of cupping, something you tasted, to, to think you knew what it was and to be completely wrong. Uh, Cause it proves that you're, that you're still open and you're still cupping with a level of bias or expectation that is appropriate and acceptable for true evaluation. Mm. Right. Yeah. And I think also sort of, you know, getting yourself away from the the false idea that there is some you know peak of of uh skill or expertise that you can reach that's going to you know get you to a place where all of this is just like you know looking at code through the matrix you see through you know transparently to like the true nature of each of these coffees like i i just think that that's like that doesn't exist that doesn't happen and so much of you know what is kind of happening among coffee professionals and coffee nerds and you know from baristas to roasters and cropster and yada yada that I, I think there's there's a there's a technophilia that makes us think that you know that there's some like true aspect that you can penetrate to and I think coffee will always throw you curveballs and thwart mm. um, a, a total transparent understanding like that. Mm. I feel very committed to asking some of these questions. So I'm going to do it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. There, there, I think that there, there, there are many strong questions in here. Uh, in the first cupping video, you highlighted the importance of relative tasting and having a comparison set. I want to understand the importance of the specific comparison set. Can the score you give to a coffee change depending on what other coffees you have on the table? It does for me. Um, <laughs> considerably um and and i know i've been with some cuppers who um who do that very explicitly we'll we'll separate out tables of things that they have a bias around i you know when i first started working for intelligentsia 17 years ago um you know all like black cat at the time was primarily 80 percent brazil and so like all the brazils got cupped differently there was actually you know i i won't say the whole method but they they had a weird way of cupping their brazils and i think a weird way of scoring them that felt to me like like unnecessary score inflation and, and i think you know that's long past for them but but it was like an idea that like well you you bend the goalposts a little bit because brazils are, are different and we're looking for something different there and so they were kind of relegated to their own table and um and and i think you know there it was like the the relativity of one lot to another is you know i mean if you're if you're doing you know lot if, if you're cupping lots to like kind of build a micro lot or you know a macro lot out of several micro lots then you know it makes sense to to treat relative scoring as you know um i i don't think you know most there aren't really that many uses for an objective score to like determine like this is a true 86 or an 87, um, except to the degree that you might, you know, need to communicate that back to your importer or to a mill or something and, and give them a sense that like you're on the same page or, or for them to understand what your opinion is 
of a coffee in a way that's kind of objective, but but mostly it's inconsequential. I don't know if that I, answered the question. But. I, no, I think I think it did, and I agree with you. So unless unless you have a contrary opinion, Scott, I'm going to power through. Oh no, that was that was great. Um, Tony is very thought provoking. I'm enjoying this. Do you experience? a difference in the flavor notes when you slurp from a spoon versus when you take a sip from the coffee cup? Yes. I mean, so I think like, you know, there's the whole, you know, retronasal yada yada. There's, there's kind of reasons why you slurp coffee the way that you do. Um, I, you know, when I'm just making coffee at home, like I'm, I think I'm probably on the end of the spectrum that I like my coffee to be much cooler. Like I have one of those, you know, Bluetooth mugs that you set the temperature on and, and I probably run mine cooler than, than most people. Like I'm happy to keep sipping a coffee at, you know, 130 degrees Fahrenheit um, for all day long. Um, and I actually, you know, don't mind drinking coffee that's completely down to room temperature. And I think part of that is just kind of cupping like, gets you used to drinking coffees that are totally room temperature. Um, but, but that first sip is usually like, while it's hot, like I'll, I'll give it the, the blast. And, and that tends to amplify like berry and forward acidity flavors. And I think kind of give you a, um, a more uh, lengthier experience of what the aftertaste of the coffee is like. Um, but but I think like there are coffees that maybe have some spark there or seem like, oh, that's a super interesting coffee and you want to like score it very high. But that the way that most people are drinking it, um, those sort of edge qualities are going to not be as much a part of the experience. And you've got to kind of think about like, does it, you know, does it have a lot going on? Like, you know, is it, is it a low body coffee with marginal sweetness that, you know, finishes kind of astringent because that coffee might be super interesting from a cupping spoon over and over and over. But when you, you know, brew it on a Chemex or, you know, throw it on bar, it's like, okay, this is a coffee that people aren't really going to enjoy drinking as is that much. Um, so I, I think, you know, context is important if you're making buying decisions or, you know, decisions about what's put on bar, decisions about what roast profiles are working. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, we, you know, we eat our own dog food at Yes Please and, and try to brew the coffee in as many different ways as possible. And um, when a customer writes in and is, you know, doing some convoluted AeroPress recipe or something, I'll <laughs> reluctantly like rinse off my AeroPress and, and try to duplicate it to understand what it is they're, they're tasting. And, uh, <laughs> it's very chivalrous. <laughs> um, yeah, this also is just something that is that is this something that only happens in offices? No, uh, I, I don't know. I can't explain why I do it, but I also like if I'm if I'm cupping and I really like one and I'm and I'm like I'm gonna buy this coffee. I will pick up the bowl and I will drink from it before I feel like it's real. And I it's yes, slurping creates and and in general drinking can create the retronasal um, and and so you you getting the olfactory evaluation as part of that but there's something about having your nose up to the liquor and, and drinking it that uh, it, this, I will, I will probably regret this wording, but if there's something about it that feels more real to me. And that's even at facsimile where like, we're not, we're not selling to, we're, we're selling people who are going to cup the coffee. So there's no, there's no reason for me to do that, but I, there's still something that feels incomplete about my evaluation without that. I don't do it to all the coffees because some of the coffees I don't always want to pick up and put to my face, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but certainly for anything that I want to uh, select. For, for the record, I cupped all of them this morning and I did take a sip out of one, two, and three when it was over because I, I do that almost <laughs> all the time, but I generally don't sip the naturals, but you know, yeah. After you cup a roasted batch, do you tend to have inferences on how you would like to brew the coffee? Would it make a nice espresso or a pour over? I understand this could be totally subjective, but if you have such inferences, it would be wonderful if you could talk to your process and approach that. Um, I, I think I think it's true that I do, but it's part of like, I, I think that there's like, 
again, because of the way like SCA is taught cupping and, you know, the cupping form and the flavor wheel and, you know, and, and that there, there's, there's the appearance of like this objective truth of, of the cupping process or the cupping table that like the context for, you know, most of my first years of cupping was I'm, you know, I'm sample roasting and I'm, you know, cupping things for, you know, what, what coffees are we selecting, but day in and day out, it's mostly like I'm cupping for blending purposes and for evaluating roast profiles. And so I, I, like the thing that I always try to see through is to kind of see through the roast, you know, be like, okay, I think I actually like this coffee, but there's something about the sample roast that's off. And, and I don't feel like there, there's, we don't have like, I think a good cuppers language to talk about that. And this is like, you know, maybe a bigger discussion for a, a podcast or something um, of, of kind of the limitations of the language that we have as roasters to talk about the characteristics that we're, you know, bringing out or emphasizing or de-emphasizing uh, in a coffee with roast profiling. You know, we have some like big descriptors like bake, front bake, back baked, and ways that we talk about this stuff. But that the the general descriptive language is is pretty um, lacking. But I think over time you do build an intuition where you're like, actually, like you know, I like if you treat this as objective and this is a true thing and like you know, number two, like everything we say about it, everything we experience here is, you know, the, the ground truth of this coffee, like over time, you'll, you'll build up a, a, you know, fifth and a half sense that like, there's something more here than what I'm seeing on the cupping table, or there's something here that I think is, you know, I'm tasting like that this was roasted on, you know, an Akawa air roaster, or, you know, you, you'll start to like get these characteristics that are like, all right, there's something in here that maybe I don't like, or that I'm like knocking points off that that's not intrinsic to the coffee. Um, so I, I definitely like in terms of espresso. And again, like I'm an old man in the espresso world. And so I, I sort of um, philosophically and maybe in my own different rabbit hole around what, what I would like to see in an espresso. Um, but I definitely like their coffees I cup were like, yeah, that would, that would work well as espresso or coffees that I cup where I, I know like that, if you put that in espresso, it better be like no more than 10% of the plant that it's, it's going to contribute too much. It's going to amplify too much. What can you learn from a coffee as it cools? Um, I mean, my feeling is it should never get worse. <laughs> um, like you might, things might diminish, um, but, uh, you should, you should enjoy it all the way to the, to the bottom temperature. Um, if, if it hits some threshold where it just like, gets weird or skunks out or something, then I, I think that's a coffee that, you know, you should, you should reject. And if you're having that experience, um, you know, at home, when you're drinking coffee that you're, you know, buying at the store or whatever from a roaster, um, and you feel like every cup kind of hits that point where like, yeah, if I don't drink it while it's hot, it's not good. Um, you know, it could be something in the way that you're brewing your coffee could be your own personal preference that you only like hot coffee but to my mind it's it's a sign that like it's it's a problem with the the, the coffee or the roasting um and and you should kick it to the curb scott i'm curious how you would talk about that because I've, I've heard you describe some of the things you some of the problems you find as coffee is cool i find that um you know when coffee cools the acidity is is a little quieter and that allows some defects to become a little easier to pick up. But I would say most important to me is that when coffee cools, it becomes much easier to decide if a roast was baked. How do you tell if a roast is baked when it cools? What do you look I for? would describe it as, as hollow, straw-like, flatter. Um, we've talked about this before, how sometimes like the, the juiciness and the sweetness tends to 
uh, hollow out and, and, and disappear. Whereas if a coffee maintains a really vibrant uh, juiciness or fruitiness, then it definitely wasn't baked. Uh, yeah. This came up because Scott pays attention to my pays attention to my internal cupping notes from the tables I'm cupping, and he's noticed certain times when I've remarked that a coffee didn't cool well, he's, he's kind of uh, pulled that aside and had it re-roasted and sent to me again without my knowledge and had me score it again with uh, results that would essentially back up what Scott is saying here. So sometimes when you don't like a coffee, it wasn't the coffee, it was the roast. No matter how much you see through the roast is the lesson I've learned. Uh, So let's see, what else do we got here? Uh, Tony, what, what first got you properly into coffee and what has been the most surprising experience that you've had tasting coffee? Oh boy, that's, um, those are probably each two long stories. I'm not sure what the second one is. The first one's pretty, pretty easy. Um, it's, it's funny because the, the premise of this question is that like, I don't want to announce it before I've actually done it, but, um, but I'm lining up some interviews with people to do just like a little video chat thing of asking people about their first time and um, uh, confessing like how they fell into coffee. Um, I mean, for, for me, um, the first time I ever tasted a coffee that made me think that I would actually enjoy drinking coffee. Like growing up, it was, you know, Maxwell house on the farm, you know, my mom with a percolator like that. It's, you know, um, I have nostalgic feelings about that, but, um, you know, couldn't understand why anybody would, would drink it. Always thought coffee was disgusting and, um, you know, moved to New York as a teenager and, um, started to try to build a life there. And, uh, um, I snuck into a fashion show in Bryant Park, uh, at the beginning of fashion week, I had a friend who was a runway model and, um, I ended up thinking I could get like a standing room pass to watch one of these, you know, runway shows to kick off a fashion week. Um, and instead I ended up with a backstage pass and like was suddenly around supermodels undressing and their celebrity boyfriends and paparazzi and the whole thing um, in a place where I definitely didn't belong. Um, and in order to be nonchalant, I wanted to have a drink in my hand and there was an espresso bar. This is, I think, 1994. Um, and, you know, got some foamy cappuccino standing next to uh, Charlie Rose and Barbara Walters in line. And nervously I just drank this thing that was not a thing that I thought I would like or ever wanted to drink an adult beverage that um and it was like damn this is like this is good this is a dangerous drug I've discovered this is something that could be a habit and I compartmentalized it as this like you know break glass in case of emergency kind of experience <laughs> that I would only indulge in if you know I needed to pull an all-nighter at my job or something and um and and just kind of keep it at arm's length. And then, you know, eventually life turned me into a, an addict and then a connoisseur. <laughs> what, what transitioned you from a drinker to someone who thought, yes, I want to, I want to apply a trade here. Um, so, you know, around the time of nine 11, I, I, I'd become a daily coffee drinker. I was drinking, you know, uh, shitty New York um, and then moved to Seattle and immediately became a espresso vivace sidewalk stand customer. You know, I lived two blocks from there and it was like, that was my daily routine. And um, Brian Fairbrother, the late Brian Fairbrother, who was the manager there and Don and like all those like early vivace baristas who really made a career out of it and were like the first baristas to sort of, I, I think, define what like barista became. Um, I, I just like hook, line and sinker just, just bought the whole thing. And I, uh, I needed a job. Um, and, uh, I walked into, I I'd gotten trained by another coffee company for like 30 minutes. Like basically they had me pull one shot of espresso and they were like, you got it. You're good. Here, 
you're a barista now. <laughs> and uh, um, I threw a, a seven page resume where I interviewed myself about how unqualified I was for the job and um, gave it to the owners of Victrola. And foolishly, they hired me the next day. Um, <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> but it was it was definitely uh, it, it was not an ambition to work in coffee. It was an ambition to escape uh, having a real job. Um, and I've avoided a real job ever since. <laughs> Tony, there, there's there's definitely a little bit. You've definitely uh, triggered a little bit of a competition to see who has the lowest ember set temperature in the chat. I just want to let you know <laughs> that. Um, Who's, seems, who who goes like lower you than might actually be a little hot. So, okay. <laughs> Tony, what would you recommend to people who want to improve their cupping skills? Um, well, I mean, reiterating what I said before, I think the first thing is is to uh, just. It, I mean, obviously, like what you're doing with facsimile is great. Like, I think that you you need to cup with other people and the more opinionated, the more loud and vocal and open to discussion they are, the better. I think that a lot of, you know, roasting companies, the cupping room feels like a little sacred. It's kind of, it's a, it's a goal. There's like lots of people competing to like, you know, be included there and, um, and kind of performing. It just, it, it can get weird. Um, so I think cupping in places where it's like low stakes and you know you're among peers is is great and just you know be comfortable you know sharing your impressions even if they're half-baked or you know wild guesses like like just take the attitude that there's no wrong answers like don't keep your mouth shut don't be timid um just like yeah talk it through and and mostly like you know have an opinion like don't don't feel like because you're a, a neophyte that like you know your opinion's not valid or that your personal preferences are secondary to some other objective truth that you're trying to discern on the cupping table because that doesn't matter what matters is like you you love coffee or you wouldn't be here so you should you should get a sense of like is this a coffee that that you enjoy is this like you know, are you getting pleasure from this? So if, yeah. if you sort of turn off the pleasure centers of your brain and just treat it as a, you know, like the SATs or something, I, I think you're gonna, like, you might think you're on a trajectory, but I think you're just, you're, you're setting a, you're setting a barrier for, for it. Like, like have, handled, have some pleasure. Yeah, I've handled a few students who are so focused on what is objectively true that they've missed what they think of the the sample and i the honestly my my biggest reaction to that is that just sounds miserable <laughs> to me because <laughs> because ultimately the score the scores are a reflection of our i mean like let's be clear it is a subjective experience it's our it's our experience with that coffee and that's it's not in someone else's mouth it's in your mouth so uh there there's you know there's nothing untrue about whether you like it or not and what you taste when you, when you do, when you do cup it. Yeah. And then I would add to that, you know, um, sort of figuring out what the specific expertise of the people that you're cupping with is. Um, if there's, you know, people that have a lot of experience at origin or at the mill level, like I think, um, understanding, you know, these are characteristics that have something to do with how the coffee was treated at the dry mill. This is a characteristic that's something intrinsic to the varietal. This is a characteristic that, you know, the roaster did something weird here that like, you know, there's actually a lot of elasticity around this that you could, you know, move that around. Like, so cupping with, you know, green buyers, with roasters, um, you know, to a degree with, with baristas, um, I think is is super helpful because the the perspectives um, and the biases are totally different. Yeah, perfect. I've learned a lot by cupping with Ryan Brown. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to ask who's someone you learned a lot from cupping with. Um, I so mean, don't mention Ryan I, Brown. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's it's interesting. I, I mean, I think like Jeff Watts is the like the the big light there. Um, because, uh, I mean, 
you know, I was reading his writing for years before, you know, I had the opportunity to get to know him and, um, and, you know, I've, I've cupped with him a, a small handful of times, but, um, but he's like his energy, he's effusive, he's enthusiastic. He has like, you know, a poet soul when it comes to like talking about coffee. And I, I think that that's just super infectious. And I've been in cupping rooms where, you know, it's much more austere and clinical and, you know, pseudoscientific. And, and I feel like you just, you don't get as much from those experiences, particularly if the coffees aren't that special, that it's sort of, it's, it's odd to like have that much pomp, pomp and circumstance around a bunch of, you know, 84, 85 point coffee. Yeah, yeah. So you, you know, but, but you could have a table like that. And if, if you're cupping with somebody who's, you know, interesting and insightful, it's, I think there's, there's a lot to learn from. So I think, you know, on a, on a spiritual level, like I think, you know, if you ever get the chance to cup with, with Watts, that's, that's great. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, I don't like to preview stuff, but it's, he and I have, <laughs> he and I have spoken. I'll just, I'll put it that way. Um, and he, and I'm glad to say he's enthusiastic. So that's wonderful. Um, he, I mean, the, the, the contributions of Jeff Watts, if you're not familiar, it, it's not just like him at the cupping table the comments on blog posts, comments on coffee, like places where where there should be nothing but drivel and nonsense. Jeff Watts has contributed more to coffee than many other top, you know, cuppers combined. Like it's, I mean, there's just, it's ridiculous. The level of depth and profundity in like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating, but like Yahoo answer questions like that. Like that's the kind of stuff we're talking about that, that Jeff Watts, right. where there, Jeff there's, Watts there's contributed treasures to be found on old yes. blog posts and forums, like long forgotten where yes. Jeff will just like spew this wisdom. It's like the, <laughs> you know, in contact, like they should have sent a poet. It's like Jeff Watts is that poet. <laughs> like, If you could scrape all that stuff from the internet, all the comments that Jeff Watts has left, like hidden all over the internet into and just printed it, it would be like an amazing book. It'd be an exceptional book on, on uh, drinking, tasting, buying coffee. Um, Tony, this was, this was super. I, I really appreciate it. Yay. I, I, pleasure, I'm, pleasure cupping with you. I'm, I'm glad I didn't embarrass you or hopefully myself too much. <laughs> I did not say that. Um, so <laughs> one comment is that my uh, I, I will post my score sheet for this cupping later today on the facsimile website in the previously section, uh, where you can also find the information about the coffees that we just cupped. Um, as always, please send us feedback. We did a couple things new today. Uh, we had the chat going. We were able to interact with it to some degree. And we did that cupping survey. Uh, if you didn't already do the cupping survey, go do the cupping survey because it helps us and we think ultimately will help you all uh, if we have access to your raw notes and scores on these coffees. Uh, I, think, I think that we have something kind of interesting happening there. Um, and please send feedback about that as well. And, and then tomorrow, Scott and I are going to, uh, Tony, I hope you don't feel like we're marching right over your parade, but we have some fun news <laughs> about our next cupping that we're going to share tomorrow. Is that right, Scott? Yes. Perfect. Um, all right. Well, Tony, thank you so much. Uh, this, this has been easily the longest uh, cupping that we've done. And that is also a testament to how much I've enjoyed that time with you. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye.